Hi, welcome to another session of the Potter's Roundtable from Washington Street Studios at the corner of Washington and Taylor Streets in beautiful downtown Bolivar, West Virginia. We're trying something new today. We're live streaming as well as recording so that we can put the video on our website. I'm Phil Bernberg, and today we're going to be discussing a sm talking about a small updraft gas kiln, the equipment, and the setup. Welcome to the Potter's Roundtable a monthly podcast where we share our passion for the ceramic arts and a collection of topics specific to potters. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Enjoy the show. So, talk, we're going to be setting up, we're going to be talking about the setup for a small updraft gas kiln. And in the future, we will also do a session on uh, actually how we prefer to operate the kiln. But today is mostly just going to be about the equipment. So we have a kiln in our studio here, Washington Street Studios, that I purchased a few years ago. And I've been experimenting with it to find the best firing conditions. It's an Olympic top-loading updraft gas kiln, model 2327G. And it looks like an electric kiln body. So I guess and here's, this is an illustration of it. It looks like an electric kiln, basically. Only the, the one that, I, that we have here has four rings instead of, as supplied, it comes with three. It's circular in cross-section. It's, it's sitting on a metal stand. And the gas burners are built into the metal stand underneath the kiln. Um, the inside height of the kiln is about 36 inches. And the inside diameter is 23, 23 inches inside diameter. Olympic still makes a version of this kiln. They've changed it a little bit. The ver this, this particular one that we have here has five burners. We'll talk more about this in a little bit. But the new version apparently only has three. My goals for this kiln have always been to achieve four, four, really four things. I wanted to achieve uniform temperatures and uniform reduction throughout the whole kiln space. I wanted to prevent reoxidation, which is uh, fairly easy to happen, especially in updraft kilns. Um, I wanted good efficiency. I, I basically wanted to minimize the gas usage as much as possible. And I really wanted repeatability of firings. I wanted to be able to establish a, a setup for the kiln and firing schedule that I could repeat over and over and, and count on getting the same results. So let's talk about the kiln equipment. When I purchased the kiln, I purchased it used, by the way, and I had no instruction manual. So the kiln consisted of the kiln stand with the built-in burners. Um, the, there was a ring-shaped pilot light, which I'll show you in a minute, five main burners. And the, the body, as you can see, consisted of four ring segments. And there's a separate top and bottom plate. And it also came with a basso valve and a thermocouple. Excuse me. By the way, the, the insulating brick on all of this kiln is two and a half inches thick. So let's go to the next to the sketch that shows the basic setup. This is what the original setup looked like. And what I've shown here is basically in operation, the flames from the, I've only shown two of the burners here, but the flames from the burners pass up through openings in the bottom of the kiln, and they pass up between the inside of the kiln walls and the edges of the shelves. And they, so the flame is meant to pass up and then out the opening in the top. The exit flue opening in the top is basically just a circular hole in the lid. It's about six and a half inches in diameter. And then, of course, what's intended is that the you'll get some movement of the flame across the shelves as well as up and out. Um, the whole, the, 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 the basically, the, the system as it's now set up, and we're going to talk about, I'll talk about some of these modifications that I made. This is what the setup looks like now. I've made a number of changes to the basic setup, and we're going to talk about them. Let's talk about the, um, the, let's go on to the next, next illustration that shows the components of the system. This is the way the system is currently set up with all the equipment components. So we have, we have two 100 gallon propane tanks that are manifolded together so that that way, depending on how much gas use, the level of gas in the tank actually doesn't drop that much. And I have, so the two tanks are, each tank has a shutoff valve on the top. I'm showing the liquid propane in the tanks here. We have two shutoff valves. And then there's a primary regulator, which basically drops the pressure from the pressure that exists in the tank. You don't want to use the tank without a regulator because the pressure can be extremely high, 100 PSI or more in the tanks, which is way high. So basically what you want to do is you want to reduce the pressure to a lower level to transport the gas to the kiln, and then you do a final adjustment at the kiln. So this primary regulator 
just produces what's called the line pressure, and that is the, the pressure of gas in the line that takes it to the kiln. And then there's a pressure gauge here, and I'll show you a photograph of what the equipment shows like in a minute, but there's a pressure gauge also that can record it. So when we operate this kiln, for example, I usually set the line pressure at about 12 PSI. And of course, in the actual setup, the, t the gas tanks are a lot further away from the kiln than shown here in the illustration for safety, for safety reasons. When you get closer to the kiln, now I have the kiln control equipment. So I have, a, a, again, I have a shutoff valve. This is sort of my safety shutoff. If I had to shut off the kiln in an emergency, that's the valve that I'd use. And I have a secondary regulator, which now I do the fine tuning of the, of the pressure. I reduce the pres pressure further. There's the basso valve, which is, this is a safety valve that basically is connected to a thermocouple on the pilot burner. So that as long as the pilot burner is lit, the, the thermocouple is activated and the basso valve stays open. If the pilot flame goes out, then the thermocouple cools down, the basso shuts off all the gas. So I don't, have, I don't have to worry about a possible explosion by pumping gas into the kiln. So then I've got my flow valve, which is a ball valve, and that's the, what, that actually controls the amount of gas that I'm putting into the kiln. And that's, how I, that's one of the ways that I regulate the firing. And then I've got five burners underneath the kiln and, and the pilot burner. So th the, first, the first thing that I noticed after I, after I actually I purchased this, the used kiln was that I couldn't actually sit the kiln on the stand because the, the burners were sticking up too high in the stand that they were coming too close to the bottom of the, of the kiln. So the first thing I had to do was shim, went, put a shim or shims between the, the kiln body and the stand of about a half an inch. I used pieces of broken kiln shelf because I had to increase the clearance. The burners were almost touching the bottom of the kiln, which was too close. So the first, before I could do anything, I had to shim up the, the kiln body. But with, and with only the, the, the basic setup in terms of the kiln itself that I showed you in the first illustration, there were some things that I learned very quickly. First of all, I couldn't get good reduction. Um, there was a big temperature gradient from the bottom of the kiln, which was hotter, toward the top of the kiln. I used a lot of gas for the firings. The kiln seemed to cool off too quickly so that I wasn't able to get good matte glazes. As you're probably aware, good matte glazes are really produced by crystallization of the, of in, the, in, the, in the glaze. So I couldn't get, it was, the kiln was cooling off too quickly to get good crystallization. And finally, I was getting reoxidation occurring fairly often. But other than that, the kiln worked great. Um, but anyway, so I decided, over the, I, I decided I need to make some changes to the kiln. So over, over the next few years, the kiln was moved several times as I moved my studio around. And I, and I experimented with a, a variety of changes that I, to, to, to the design or the setup of the kiln. One of the first things that I wanted to do, could we go to the next photo? Uh, well, let's, let me just point these out. I forgot. These are the, these are the individual components. So you can see what they actually look like. These are our two 100-gallon gas tanks storage tanks for the propane. And now if we, take, if we open the lid on one of these propane tanks, we see this. This is the shutoff valve for the tank. This is the line coming in from the second tank. So the two tanks are connected. So there's a shutoff valve on the, on the one tank, a shutoff valve here. And I open those two tanks, and then the gas from both tanks goes through this primary regulator, which is, I really don't adjust that. I set that once so that the line coming out of it, this yellow tubing here, that's the line going to the kiln. I get about 12 PSI, so I, I, I pretty much leave it set at that. And then this is now the other end. This is when I've gotten to the kiln, the bottom of the back of the kiln. So this is a shutoff. That we, we set up this thing actually so that this plumbing so that we could actually add another kiln later on, which actually we're in the process of building right now. We're building a soda wood gas kiln that will be connected probably to this pipe here. But so we have a shutoff valve here. This is the small secondary regulator which allows me to fine tune the pressure going into the kiln. This is a pressure gauge. And here's my, here's my basso valve. And this is actually, I'll talk about this later, but this is a, a, a rain cover that I put over it. And there's my flow valve for the kiln. And also coming off the basso valve, this is the gas line that feeds, this is the, the beginning of the pilot burner. So this little valve here, I can adjust the gas on the pilot burner and it has an air intake. And we'll talk more about the pilot burner in a minute. But um, I, that's the way, so this is, this is the, the setup right at the kiln. Okay, the next one. Okay, this is, the first thing I added when I, when I started firing the kiln was, I, I realized I needed a damper somehow over the top of the kiln. And what I ended up using, I tried different things. I tried kiln shelves and a variety of different solutions. 
what I came up with that worked pretty well was two insulating fire bricks, and I marked the, sur the top of the kiln. I used like a, a, a black mason stain. I marked the surface of the kiln with one inch markings so that I could record the spacing between the two bricks. And this is an important part I found of keeping my records when I was doing the firing was to record the, the, the damper or the exit flue opening. And for this kiln, even with all the changes I've made, I found that even sometimes an adjustment of an eighth of an inch is enough to change the way the kiln is operating. So it became more and more important, and I realized that it was very important to have these markings so that I could reproduce the settings. Okay. The next thing I did was I, I um, th 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 in this sketch, so the, here, here are my two damper bricks shown on top of the kiln. Um, the next thing I did was I varied this, and this is one of the things that I spent a lot of time working on. I varied the space underneath this bottom shelf. Here's the bottom shelf in the original setup. And I, because what, basically what you need with a gas kiln is you need enough time for the gas and the secondary air, that's the air coming in around the burner, to completely mix to get good combustion. One of the problems with small gas kilns and even small wood kilns is that sometimes by the time the fuel and the air have mixed thoroughly and you're getting the hottest flame, the flame is in the chimney. It's basically passed through the body of the kiln. So somehow you have to do whatever you can to get the flame, the gas in the air to mix as soon as possible as they enter the kiln so that, you, so that most of the heat is, is retained in the kiln. So that's what this space below the bottom, the bottom shelf is intended to be. It's intended to be sort of a combustion chamber where the, air, the secondary air coming in around the burner and the primary air coming in through the burner can, can mix before it actually goes up higher in the kiln and contacts the pots. So I played around a lot with different spacings and I was trying to reach a compromise between not taking up too much of the space in the kiln for this chamber and still leaving me enough, enough wear space to put pots into the kiln. So I was trying to achieve a balance. Um, so one of, the, one of the, the final solution I came up with is I found that about four and a half inches seemed to be a good spacing underneath this bottom shelf. So there are no pots on the next shelf up. In, this, in the original setup there were. There were pots on this shelf and I just had this space underneath it. But in this case, I ended up with about a four and a half inch spacing. The other, the another, another change that I made to the kiln that I found helped me get better control was I added what I'm calling a baffle plate or a baffle shell. I added a smaller diameter shelf. This is, I think I mentioned it's 23 inches inside diameter. I added a 16 inch shelf that I placed on, I, I supported on kiln posts just below the exit hole. I found that around seven eighths of an inch or three quarters of an inch gap between the, 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 that, that baffle and the bottom of the lid is a, is a good working space. And what this does is it slows down the exit of the gases before they even get to the damper plates. And it also deflects some, it, it works, I think, better to deflect some of the gases in the flame back down inside the kiln. So the combination of the baffle plate and the damper bricks, bricks I can get pretty good control of the gas flow through the kiln. We hope you're enjoying the show. Please take a moment to leave a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice. It really helps new listeners find the show. Don't forget to subscribe to receive updates as new episodes are released. And if you'd like to support the video and podcast production of the Potter's Roundtable, become a patron. Go to patreon.com and search for the Potter's Roundtable. Your support will help us achieve our goal of creating a digital library spanning the ceramic arts for use by educators and artists alike. Thank you for your support. Now let's get back to the show. Um, another thing, another feature that we uh, that I tried to do was to address things like the reoxidation. I tried adding a sheet metal barrier around the, the outside of the kiln stand at the end of a firing. Because one of the problems with this kind of a kiln is where the, the burners are permanently mounted in the kiln stand, I can't move them. So in another, in, a, in another kind of kiln, I might be able to move the burner at the end of the fire, firing and insert some kind of a blockade or a plate or a piece of kiln shelf to close off the, the, the burner ports. But I can in this case because the, the burners are fixed and the bottom of the kiln is fixed, so there's no easy way to block off the burner ports. So especially if it's a windy day and I'm getting drafts, it's even if I close the damper on top, it's still possible to get a draft coming in the bottom of the kiln during cooling. 
So I tried putting this shield around it out of, out of just sheet metal, and it helped a little bit. Um, but as you'll see, we had, we, I ended up going to um, a, a cinder block or a concrete block barrier that seemed to work actually better. One of the other things that I added in terms that I find, this is probably the most recent change, I realized that even with playing around with the different heights of this bottom shelf, the, the, the height of the combustion chamber, I still wasn't getting good mixing, really, of the gas in the air, because I still had quite a temperature gradient from the top of the bottom to, and top to the bottom, and also reduction also. I tended to get hotter temperatures toward the bottom and better reduction toward the top. So I was trying to get some kind of a balance. And what I, what I finally came upon was I needed some way to actually cause more turbulence. That is more, 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 instead of just what's called streaming, where the gas just kind of flows smoothly and evenly in a line, I wanted the gases to kind of churn around inside the kiln. So what I ended up doing was I'll take like a four inch kiln post and I laid them down on, the, on top of this bottom shelf so that they stick out over and partially block the path of the flame. And the idea is that when the flame hits the kiln post, it disperses the flame and, ca and causes turbulence and causes it to mix with the air better. So I have five of these, these posts, since there are five burners, over each post there's a burner that's sticking out. It doesn't completely touch the wall. I had to play with that spacing also. How far does the end of the, the, the post come to the wall? Because I want some of the, I don't want to deflect the whole flame. I want some of the flame to pass up toward the top, but I also want a lot of it to be mixed and sort of churned and interrupted by, the, by these posts. So I think we have a photograph now of, of what they actually look like from the inside. So here's, this is looking down on the inside of the kiln. So this is, this is the, you can see that's, the, that's the, the ground underneath. This is the end of one of the burners, and this is the burner port. And this is, this is the, um, the, bur the end of, this is the wall of the kiln right here. This is the end of the post sticking out over the, covering up the burner. We're looking at it at an angle here. When you look straight down, this post is directly over the burner port. And as you can see, there's still some clearance. This is about an inch distance here from this corner in the brick to the, to the end of the kiln post. And I found this really, this immediately when I tried this, I, after I played a little bit with the, the, the location of the kiln post, this immediately improved the, the overall reduction and reduced the temperature gradient in the kiln. Because I was getting better mixing. I was getting the gases to move around. By the way, this, this, is, this is an aside, but the way I supported this, this shelf, the bottom shelf underneath the one that this is resting on, is I use, I wanted to transfer a lot of the load to the outside closer to where the metal frame is because the bottom of the kiln, the center, is not supported. So instead of using kiln posts just on the outside, I used three, I had three large refractory bricks, nine inch long bricks that go into about this far. And so this is, this is a brick, the end of a brick that's supporting the bottom shelf. And I used three of them and I had them sticking out like this so I can tell where to put the kiln posts. So that when I look down into the kiln and I'm adding additional shelves, I want to line them up to go over. I, I know where the, the, the support is, and I can line up all my posts, such as this one, so that they're over the support in the bottom of the kiln. Um, OK, uh, let's see. So one of the, so, so I, added, I added the deflectors. Oh, and then I also, so now I've got, the, I've got the shelf with the deflectors, and then I've got the shelf above it, and that's where, um, I, that's where I start putting my pots. So I also made some changes for the firing procedure in addition to the setup. And I looked at, I, I added um, using a parameter um, to, the, to, the, to the kiln. And I found I only use that, however, for monitoring temperature, the temperature rise. I don't fire using a parameter in terms of looking for the maturity of the pots. That should be done with cones, and we use cones. But I can monitor the temperature rise so that when I go into reduction, I can make sure that my temperature isn't dropping, that I've achieved the right balance between the gas and the air, so that when I'm in heavy reduction and I'm reducing the glazes and I'm reducing the clay, I'm still, I'm still increasing the temperature slightly. I'm not losing temperature. So I can, it's mainly to sort of follow the progress of the heating. And it also tells me whether I'm making, if I'm making little adjustments to the kiln in terms of the damper, that I'm making the correct adjustments, that I haven't sort of gotten off the track. I've also played around with different shelf spacings. I've, I've, I looked at different heating rates. I looked at a range of different damper settings. I actually, I varied the diameter of the baffle plate. I tried different shelves in terms, it turns out I ended up with a 16 inch, but I tried smaller ones to begin with and larger ones to begin with to see if there was an effect of that. And there was an effect. I, I played around, as I mentioned, with the gap between above the baffle plate and the bottom of the inside of the kiln, and that has an effect. 
Um, and I also looked at adjusting the primary air on the burners. The burners have these little sort of collars that you can rotate around the tube of the burner, and you can increase or decrease the amount of primary air that's getting into the burners. And I found that the best system was to not mess with that, is set the burners before I even start the firing, set the burners for the, for the optimum amount of air to get complete burning of the gas, and then just leave them like that. So I haven't, I haven't in, in 10 years now, I haven't changed the air settings on the primary burners. They're just set to operate at, at what I consider to be the most efficient. Okay, the kiln, currently the kiln is installed outside. Um, under, this is, we have an outside pavilion. This is our new soda kiln that we're building. But this is, this, it's installed with, with the concrete blocks around it. And basically, this gives me a place to stand um, when I'm loading the kiln. But it also it has provided a nice block in terms of drafts, be, especially because it's outside. This is a fence here. But it's still, if it's windy, you could get drafts that are coming in under the kiln. So this has worked really well to reduce drafts. And I would see that when I'm firing, if the wind was coming up, I could watch the thermocouple. And if I was getting draft, like back drafts in the bottom or back drafts down the top, that would show up on the thermocouple. I'd see the fluctuation in it. So it's surrounded by this low concrete wall that works pretty well. The, the kiln lid itself, the, when I, when I, is, we used a chain to hold that up because I didn't, I don't like, I didn't want it to rest it. And we, there's no, there's no, and this is an earlier model, so there wasn't any kind of a lid lifter or any kind of a mechanism to hold it up. So um, the, we use a chain that that I can hook onto here and hold it up, connected to the roof of the of the, the pavilion to hold it up when I'm when I'm loading or unloading. By the way, what, what I also did here was this this little mark on the inside. That also shows me the location of the supports at the bottom of the kiln. So I line up my kiln post. If for some reason I can't see that support, I know that that's, that's one place where the kiln posts need to be. Um, the other thing is there's a vent. You can see partially in this photograph, but I think we have a better photograph of it. We installed a vent pipe over the kiln. During the firing, the vent is lowered, this chain system. I can lower it down. Basically, I want it to keep the flame, which sometimes you know, can be three or four feet long, I wanted to keep that from burning the paint off our, our really nice new pavilion roof. So this, this just catches almost all of it and just gets it out from under the roof. And when I'm not using it, I, this, by the way, this is a counterbalance I put on here because when it's, again, we're outside, it's windy. So if you put a heavy weight, these are washers stacked up. And if you put a heavy weight on it that swings at a different velocity or different frequency than this, it tends to dampen the motion. So this is a motion damper so that this thing doesn't swing wildly in the wind. But I can take a chain and just crank this up out of the way so that when I'm loading, it's not in the way of the lid. So I guess, um, let's see. So we have, we go, can we go back to the, this, the photo setup, the, 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 the final setup of the whole thing, Dennis, that shows the, the, the diagram that shows them? Yeah, with this one. OK. So basically, with this setup, this is our final arrangement. So I've got the damper bricks. I've got the baffle plate. I've got four and a half inches. And this is four and a half inches because that's the width of one of these bricks that I've got supporting the bottom shelf. They're four and a half inches by two and a half by nine. So I'm turning them on their edge. They're standing like that. So that's why that's four and a half. This is, th I played around with this spacing also. This is three inches. And then there are my, my kiln post deflectors. So my first pots actually sit right on that shelf. What I've shown here also, these are the approximate locations of the peep, the peep holes in the kiln. So with, it, with this setup, I found we're getting really good repeatable results. A typical firing only lasts about four and a half hours. And we're only using, depending on the firing, if I add a hold at the end or not, we're only using between two and three gallons of propane, which I think is pretty, I'm, I'm very satisfied with that. We are going to be, we'll, we will be talking in a future session, we'll be talking about actually our firing procedure and going into a few more details about that. I wanted this film today to be mostly about the equipment. So anyway, we hope that this discussion has been useful. Um, and as usual, we know if, you know if it's a lot of information at one period of time, you can hear it again by listening to our podcast. Just, just search on the Potter's Roundtable on your favorite podcast platform. If you enjoyed the presentation, please, oh, I forgot, I'm, I'm off the track here. There's one more slide. Do we have another slide beside this one? Or is that it? Okay, this was one more a little extra detail I wanted to show you, was the fact that Basso valves, I don't believe, are particularly waterproof because there's a, this is the button that you push down on the top of the basso valve to actually, to when you're starting the gas. And so I cut a tin can. By the way, it has to be an imported tomato sauce can to really work well. But I cut a tin can, and I cut out openings in it so that it'll slide down over the top of the basso valve. 
and it acts like a rain shield because this, this is sticking out a little bit toward the end of our pavilion and it does get rained on, as you can tell from the rust on the can. But so far, this has worked great. It keeps all the water off the basso valve so we don't have a problem with it. Okay, so as I was saying, anyway, so if you, if you enjoyed it, um, please like it and subscribe to our channel and share it with your friends. This helps our videos get found on YouTube. If you didn't like it, please tell us why. Maybe we can do better in the future. Also, check out our website, www.hfclay.com. Well, we really want to thank our patrons for supporting our educational efforts. And if you'd like to help us, consider becoming a patron. Go to patreon.com and look for the Potter's Roundtable. We have five options, five different patronage levels that you could subscribe to. And we decided, instead of naming them the typical gold, silver, bronze, platinum, we decided to give them clay names. So. The first, the first level we have is, is what we're calling a clay patron, and that's for a dollar a month. And in, in exchange, you get recognition on our patron appreciation page in, our, in all of our videos. The second level that we have, we're calling a bisque level, which is um, $5 a month. And again, you get the recognition, plus you get a Potter's Roundtable sticker that you can put on your laptop or wherever you like, or on your forehead. Um, works like this. Um, the third level that we have is called the earthenware level. That's $10 a month. You get all the previous benefits, plus you get a transcript of any available episode that we have every month, a transcript of the, of the, of the presentations. The, the stoneware level is the next one. That's for $20 a month. You get all the previous benefits, plus you get one of our Potter's Roundtable t-shirts that looks like this. And the final level that we have is what we're calling the porcelain patron level, which is for $50 a month. And again, you get all the previous benefits. And you also get a handmade by, our, by Dennis, our, our, one of our founding members here, a handmade uh, pot, Potter's Roundtable mug. So we'd appreciate any kind of support you can provide. The Potter's Roundtable is brought to you by Washington Street Studios and our patrons. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe, give us a five-star review and tell your friends. If you want to learn more about Washington Street Studios and shared studio memberships, please visit our website at www.hfclay.com. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time on the Potter's Roundtable.